so in typical fashion, the title that you have on the program does not reflect uh, the title that should be on the screen, it isn't. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is going to focus, well, for the first half, I'm going to talk about some of the research I've done in the past few years. Um, but I'm going to focus more or less on the methodological approaches and the issues and dilemmas that I've faced. So I fear, after following up on a lot of excellent talks uh, this morning, uh, that this might come off as a little bit of a pedestrian account of uh, one person's research methods. Uh, but I hope that we can get, you know, by following the sort of pedestrian route, maybe come across uh, some insights or maybe a bit of debate. Uh, so as you may know, um, I focus on visibility and surveillance on social and digital media platforms. And the reason why I find this to be uh, very remarkable is that um, we're studying uh, seemingly all-encompassing uh, social platform that at the same time is actually quite unstable, just in terms of some of the base assumptions we make about what is social and digital media and what they do and how they render us visible. Um, there's still, I think, a lot of ambivalence about that. Uh, so my main focus right now is on policing. And so this includes both um, policing by actual law enforcement agents, um, as well as the kind of policing that users themselves perform. Hence, in my original title, the crowdsourced and consolidated efforts uh, bits. So there's a lot that's visible on social media. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But there's still a lot of activity that remains uh, very speculative or, or unknown. So what I'm going to do uh, right now um, is focus on these three sort of examples of, of research that I've done recently, and then afterwards talk about the methods in greater detail. Uh, and I think, especially <coughs> thinking about social media, um, as with you know all forms of surveillance, as uh, uh, David and others had mentioned up until this point, there's always that ambivalence about uh, you know balancing the harm against the good. And not that it should just come down to a balancing act, um, but what I've attempted to do in my research um, is consider some of those instances of harm and then reassess the platform overall and some of the benefits and you know, try and reconcile um, what it is to, to have a presence on social media. So the first example, um, I'm, should I yeah. uh, the first example uh, that I want to talk about, and you might have uh, seen me give a talk using this slide before, uh, I apologize in advance, um, is the crowdsourced surveillance efforts uh, that were led entirely by users themselves. So following uh, the 2011 uh, Vancouver riots, um, people loosely affiliated with the city of Vancouver, uh, regular social media users, went online, uh, launched a bunch of groups, uh, this one was had the most traction, um, and used this as sort of a venue uh, to post pictures of suspected rioters, and then other people would come in and provide evidence about, oh, you know, I saw this person doing that, or in fact, this person was not a rioter. Um, it was sort of this user-led policing. Um, it gathered about 100,000 users in a little under a week. Um, a lot of data was sort of converged onto uh, this platform, and a lot of user-led policing took place. Um, a lot of social harm came from this. Um, but what was remarkable about this example was that of course, hockey riots are not a novelty in Canada, um, but the visibility of rioters as a result of crowdsourced efforts, and also as a result of users themselves, or rioters themselves taking pictures, uh, posting it online, and so on, uh, rendered what would otherwise be an anonymous crowd of uh, people into you know, a, a very visible and supposedly very identifiable uh, group of individuals. Uh, what was interesting for me as a researcher is not only that the riot itself became very visible, but this kind of surveillance effort found on this page, which you can still access, uh, itself was also very visible. There was a lot of data that was, you know, arguably generated from this effort. Uh, so with a colleague uh, at the University of British Columbia Okanagan campus, uh, we uh, authored uh, two pieces, uh, two articles uh, on this. So the first one was looking at well, first of all, what kind of surveillance and what kind of policing is taking place on this platform? And the second one, which was um, for a symbolic, uh, studies in symbolic interaction uh, journal, uh, was considering more how the participants um, and the users were making sense of this scenario and how they were using social media uh, in that sort of meaning-making progress process. 
Uh, the second example um, that I've been focusing on recently is uh, the crowdsourcing of specifically CCTV surveillance uh, through the internet. So whereas the first example I was talking about was more, you know, bottom-up kind of um, uh, surveillance practices, this is a bit of a mix of, there's still, you know, the crowd is still involved, there's still that kind of crowdsourcing effort, but here it's more of a top-down imposition uh, by way of a business model. Uh, so there's a number of examples uh, that have come out recently where uh, businesses try to, uh, to use the term monetize crowdsourced efforts in the context of surveillance. Um, I chose Internet Eyes to talk, uh, sort of focal point right now, uh, just because it's a rather remarkable and controversial um, uh, setup. So the way it works is this business, Internet Eyes, um, sort of acts as a broker between small businesses like shopkeepers and so on, and users who have computers who want to watch CCTV footage. Uh, both parties pay in a little bit, um, and then they, the feeds are anonymized and randomized and sent to individual users' computers. Um, people report uh, when they see a uh, crime, and the person who reports the most crime successfully gets a uh, thousand pounds, a uh, thousand uh, British pounds, not like a thousand pounds of butter or something. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else gets a very negligible amount uh, per hour, like I think 50, uh, 50 pence or 60 pence an hour. It's, you can't earn a living wage off this. Uh, so this echoes, or looking at this, you see a lot of the same issues that people like uh, Clive Norris and others uh, have reported in terms of uh, the problematic uh, aspects of CCTV camera work. Um, but in addition, there's this whole crowdsourcing element, which um, I won't get into details right now, but it was actually uh, quite remarkable, some of the controversies that came up um, uh, through uh, uh, English uh, NGOs, uh, the Information Commissioner's Office, and so on. Um, but just some of the ways that this CCTV content could leak and be repurposed. So um, uh, I wrote an article that's now being published in Information Communication Society on this topic. And when I was sort of combing around, um, I was looking at this <coughs> Facebook group, that's the official Internet Eyes Facebook group, and just the kind of repurposing that would take place there where uh, people would um, uh, post uh, really sarcastic remarks about uh, some of the people who are under watch, like their behavior or their appearance, and you think, well, first of all, these people don't know they're being, or they, they may or may not be aware of the fact that they're under CCTV scrutiny. They probably don't know that this CCTV footage is then being crowdsourced to who knows who. I mean, people could be in Canada or in Argentina watching a shop in the UK, and they certainly do not know that their behavior and their appearance is then being discussed in a very disparaging manner on a social media platform. So that kind of leaking out of, of personal details um, is concerning. Now, whereas the first two examples, it's more or less, I mean, the, 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 the social and digital media users are active participants um, in this scrutiny. Uh, what I'd like to consider uh, as my third example is how the police themselves are making use of social media. Uh, so this is just a graph that I did up um, to kind of, as a very preliminary uh, inventory of the methods through which they can watch over people. So here we have uh, two individuals, their respective laptops, their uh, internet service providers, and then the social media platform right here. Um, the two individuals have uh, profiles which consist of public and private information. They also have private correspondences with, uh, within the platform between each other. And then you have uh, the police and other law enforcement agencies. Um, first of all, uh, the police can uh, set up a, their own uh, profile, likely not uh, an official police profile if they want to uh, do investigations, uh, which itself can consist of public and private data. So they can do sort of a manual search by having a presence, logging on, um, accessing people's public data, or submitting a friend request, and then also accessing more uh, intimate uh, they can also make official requests uh, to, uh, long, uh, to uh, social media platforms and then obtain, depending on the platform, uh, a lot more uh, private information. This is a real challenge in Europe because um, even if uh, companies like uh, Facebook have offices in Ireland, the perception, and a lot of it comes down to uh, the judge's perception, so even from what I could tell, uh, comes down to it being perceived as an American company Hence, you have to go through uh, 
the Swedish justice system, the Department of Justice in the US, the FBI, or maybe the FBI and the DOJ, and then the service provider, and then all the information has to be relayed back. So this, uh, surprisingly, uh, isn't a uh, very effective means. Uh, you also have things such as open source intelligence, where, uh, like, you know, tweaked Google search engines or other sort of software or whatever um, would comb through any sort of openly available uh, information on profiles. Uh, so here, you know, you can just sort of tap into any public records, um, tweets, and so on. Uh, there's also lawful interception where you would sort of um, intercept at the as the, the information is being communicated. This often happens, as far as I can understand, at the level of the internet service provider itself, but it doesn't have to. Uh, there's also targeted interception where you, um, someone can uh, set up like a Trojan or you know a program that pretends to do one thing but is actually doing another thing on a target's computer, and then just get straight at the source. And once any of this information is collected, uh, there's also all sorts of tools and software and hardware that performs further analysis, things such as event reconstruction. So taking a bunch of tweets, and then if they're geotagged, seeing where people were at certain points and what they were saying and doing. Uh, there's also a facial recognition software, which may or may not work too well, depending on what it's uh, the load it's taking on at once. Uh, sentiment analysis, which is really big for marketers, but now also for identifying uh, lone wolf terrorists and all sorts of other, uh, you know, sort of current focuses for the security uh, industry, uh, and so on. And of course, a lot of what's coming out right now in terms of um, business solutions or law enforcement solutions are like these kind of platform suites that combine <coughs> several of these elements. So, for this, um, I started uh, with uh, like a basically document analysis, uh, just to get a sense of the inventory of uh, what's available in terms of technology, and then uh, moved on to interviews with uh, specific law enforcement agents. So here, I mean, this is, even though users are somewhat involved uh, in this kind of surveillance, um, they're often probably not aware of the fact that they're participating in this kind of data collection. And they may not be aware of the fact that uh, um, if if I'm suspected of committing a crime and you're my Facebook friend and you have information uh, that might be relevant to law enforcement agents, uh, you may not be aware of the fact that you are possibly serving as a kind of criminal informant. And I hesitate to use the word criminal informant in that case just because uh, the climate and what's you know technically possible, what's legally possible, and what, what's morally and ethically correct is still, still quite plastic. So, I'm, yeah, I'm going to now talk about uh, the different methodologies I used uh, with this research. And I should really stress the fact that um, it's in preparing for this presentation I've reflected on this a lot. Uh, often, you know, like when the, the Vancouver ride came up, this data was available, and I thought, oh, this is brilliant, and I want to just, you know, start going through this and then, you know, collaborating with people. And then all of a sudden, uh, these publications came up, and I thought, well, what actually, you know, what did we do? Um, uh, so, yeah, first of all, I'll talk about uh, document analysis. So in order to make sense of what was going on here, um, and in order to, to understand, yeah, what's available in terms of new technology, uh, I started looking at brochures and white papers and uh, uh, technology websites, just, you know, as a very sort of introductory starting point for me. Um, and what would be... Uh, Yeah, this, I mean, was a bit of a challenge for me in the sense that um, by training I'm a sociologist. Uh, I know how to work email and I have a Facebook account, but beyond that, uh, a lot of the, the technological terms were sort of out of my range. Um, but what was a really helpful sort of uh, starting point for doing this kind of research was actually the uh, WikiLeaks uh, spy files. So what this, uh, this leak was, uh, was a series of uh, companies uh, that were in the business of distributing surveillance technology. So just using their <coughs> list of companies uh, as a point of departure, um, you could then, and, you could, and it was categorized in terms of what kind of surveillance they perform. So find the ones which arguably used um, or performed internet surveillance or developed technology for this. It might not be an exhaustive <coughs> list, 
but it was a helpful starting point. So then I would go to those websites and conduct uh, a Google search based on their domain of you know, terms like social media or uh, law enforcement or um, uh, targeted interception just to see what would come up in a very sort of exploratory kind of sense. Now, there was this kind of discursive barrier here uh, in the sense that I was you know, figuring out how deep packing inspection related to lawful interception and making sense of the seven layers and all this kind of stuff which you may or may not know about. And at the same time, I was also swimming through a lot of uh, commercial documentation, a lot of um, a lot of BS to, to put it very <laughs> and so trying to evaluate, you know, what what was techn te uh, technologically possible and what uh, wasn't uh, was a bit of an issue. Um, and so uh, to, to borrow a term that uh, Usha uh, mentioned yesterday, you know, when you encounter any of these documents, you shouldn't take it too literally. Uh, I also attended um, a trade show in the UK uh, on this topic. And it was interesting just to, to meet with some of the security professionals there, but I was really struck, I shouldn't have been, by the, the barriers in terms of, you know, they would, um, you know, I'd have my, my, my security conference tag with me, they'd take a look down and see that I'm, you know, not working for the US government or not working for any big purchaser, and then, thank you, you know, move along. Um, the second uh, method that I want to talk about was the analysis of uh, Facebook groups. So what I was focusing on uh, for the Vancouver Rive was all this data on this public uh, Facebook group. And of course, this rendered the Vancouver Rive into one of the most documented rides. Um, I used a qualitative media analysis, which my colleague uh, Christopher Schneider can speak to a lot more than I can in this short period of time uh, to make sense of some of the themes that would come up and how the themes are related to each other. So we were focusing on instances where users were watching over other users. Um, and this was informed by a general motivation to watch the watchers, as it were, to make those, you know, to, to, to make those practices visible. And of course, in a sense, this is public data. This is sort of a very public, visible group. It's a group about making the right itself visible. Yet, um, I, f I still feel very ambivalent about using that data in the sense that there isn't that sort of explicit consent. Uh, this, one can argue that this is a public record in the same way that a newspaper editorial is. Um, and not all information on Facebook is public in the same way or private in the same way. Yet there still is a sense of, you know, can this cause these people harm? Of course, I never, you know, er everybody's statements was anonymized, yet by virtue of the fact that this is still public data, it's this weird sort of mix of a lot of concerns which we can discuss in the questions. So my approach to this now is that, um, what I want to do, especially with focusing on the internetized groups, and also if I come back to other sorts of crowdsourced surveillance on Facebook, is then contact the individuals and perform uh, either you know email exchanges or face-to-face -face interviews or some some variation thereof, and that leads me to uh, my third methodology, which is uh, interviews with key social agents. Now. I, I love interviews. I, that was my main methodology for my uh, PhD. Uh, you get a sense of people's attitudes. You can also get some hints about people's behaviors. You confirm certain biases. You learn a lot of new themes related to your research that you didn't anticipate. Uh, but access, especially in our fields, is an issue. And so for my PhD, I was first interviewing um, individual college-aged uh, users. And they were very enthusiastic uh, to talk about how they would use Facebook for surveillance. Institutional users were, um, you know, people employed to do this, were also kind of um, enthusiastic, but they had a few concerns about their own careers and what, you know, what they stood to lose from talking to me. Uh, people who were involved sort of on the marketing end of things were even more ambivalent, it was a bit trickier. Now with police and security, um, I mean, there's a reason why I didn't focus on that too much during my PhD, um, and I think anyone <coughs> who's done work in, or at Queens or in Kingston who tried to reach prison populations or prison guards uh, knows that there are a lot of barriers in place. So the reason I was able to, in the end, uh, speak to uh, police officials, and actually uh, you know, rather important ones, was because of my affiliation with the European Commission project. So having that kind of affiliation, as well as a colleague in the Swedish law department where I was, uh, or in the 
law department of the Swedish University I belong to. Uh, this one individual just happened to be on this committee with all the top Swedish cops who were involved with internet and social media surveillance. So just by virtue of that blind luck work, I arrived in Sweden and unbeknownst to me, uh, this uh, <coughs> law professor was sort of, not, it seemed like he was, we were in his good books even though I just arrived there. And so just through happenstance, I was able to access these people. Uh, and that was brilliant. Um, but then the issue with working with these kinds of large projects is uh, you have to deal with things like security clearances, you have to deal with things such as uh, co-authorship uh, stipulations, um, and all sorts of other kinds of barriers which limit your ability to, to sort of disseminate or engage with the public with this information. Um, I guess what's interesting here, what I was really struck by was um, uh, yesterday, David was talking about the importance of collaboration. And I've always enjoyed collaborative research for its intrinsic, um, I guess it's not necessarily intrinsic, but just you know, for the sake of producing good work with people you know and you admire. Um, but also taking advantage of the credentials and the credibility of other people in different disciplines was an enormous asset. So belonging to uh, a European Commission grant uh, with a lot of legal scholars opened up doors that I wouldn't be able to access otherwise. Um, and having, you know, having connections to very specific people who themselves are very well connected uh, in a foreign country um, made things so much easier for me. So just to wrap up, um, I think many of us are facing a very dynamic and, and challenging topics, you know. Uh, trying to get something published where you might wait a year and by the time it's published you're you know you have to revise all your facts and all your claims um, not to sound too you know present too much hyperbole but there is that sense that you know things kind of slip out of one's control um, i think of course you know it's not a matter of shifting or relying on one approach or one methodology but trying to employ and combine uh, different ones um, especially given the novelty of a lot of these topics. And of course, combining different skill sets and different uh, credentials and different disciplines is always great. Uh, unfortunately, that then has to get balanced out uh, against the desirability of having sole authored publications. And I think there is a way to sort of strike that balance and basically to do a lot of both, you know, a lot of sort of collaborative work and then kind of branch off and do your own sole authored or co authored sole discipline publications. You know, finding the time for that, now there's a challenge. Um, but what, you know, just to end on sort of a positive note, uh, what I've been struck by is how um, in studying things like social media and surveillance, uh, among academics, among users, among the public, there's this lingering sense of bewilderment that we all kind of don't know what's going on. And I think that's a bewilderment that a lot of different groups of people share. And I think that's a kind of bewilderment that allows us as academics to actually have more I don't want to say an authoritative voice, but a, a voice with a bit of traction when we uh, are able to sort of you know, present our research findings uh, to an interested public. Thank you.